it on this end. Okay, terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Public Safety Committee meeting for February 27th, 2024. I'm Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez, Chair of Public Safety Committee. Mr. Litt, if you would please call the roll. Uh, yes, Councilmember Rodriguez. I, I hear. <laughs> Sorry. Councilmember Lee. Present. Councilmember Oscar. Here. Councilmember Park. Present. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Here. Very good. Give me, I had a 7 a.m. flight this morning, so I'm a little discombobulated. Um, thank you so much. And so uh, just before we open up public comment, I just wanted to uh, uh, provide the, uh, the items that I'd like to recommend going on consent. Uh, that uh, we have items 3, 4, 7 through 20 and 22 through 24 on consent with the following recommendations. For items 3 and 4, approve the recommendations in the Board of Police Commissioners report. For item 7, approve the recommendations in the Board of Fire Commission report. Item 8, approve the recommendations in the CAO report and note and file the Mayor's report. Item 9, approve the recommendations in the City Administrative Officer's report and note and file the City Attorney's report. For item 10, concur with the recommendations from the Trade, Travel, and Tourism Committee. Items 11 through 20, note and file the clerk's reports as they are informational only. Items 22 through 24, approve the motions as written. And so uh, with that, uh, uh, Ms. Kelly, if you would uh, kindly uh, provide the instructions for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. To members of the public wishing to provide public comment, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic and when in general public comment, you must be speaking to something within the subject matter jurisdiction of the committee. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are on topic, you'll get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not get immediately on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. And so uh, we will go ahead and begin general public comment, and we do not have anyone signed up for general public comment. So now that concludes general public comment, we will close that. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so now that goes to, uh, brings us to the following items. As I indicated, uh, Mr. Soto Martinez, I understand you want to hold items 3, 8, and 10? Yes, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay, so 3, 8, and 10, hold on, give me one second. And um, so for items three, okay, so uh, Mr. Lid, we'd like, uh, as previously uh, disclosed then, I'd like to uh, recommend that we take uh, four through four, excuse me, four, seven through uh, seven, nine, 11 through 20, 22 through 24 on consent with the recommendations that I made earlier. Very good for that block of items. Uh, Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Very good. That block of items is approved. Thank you. And Mr. Soto Martinez, did you just want to take those items separately? Uh, yes, yes, Madam Chair. No, no questions on my end. I'm sorry? No questions. We can take them. Okay, together. so then if we can go ahead and take uh, 3, 8, and 10 together, Mr. Lib. Very good. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez? No. Very good. All consent items have been considered. Thank you very much. And if you would please call, what was that? Did you have, oh. 
Uh, would you please call item one into the record? Very good. Item number one is a verbal update from the mayor's office regarding gang reduction and youth development in summer night's lights. Thank you. And I just wanted to check and see if there uh, was a change in someone from the mayor's office attending a meeting today. Going once, going twice, okay. Uh, and so colleagues, uh, you may remember that last year uh, your, we had GRID and Summer Night Lights uh, come into the committee uh, in June to provide a report back uh, as part of the resources that we had put in the unappropriated balance and that we had received updates. This was part of our uh, instruction that was given during budget time. So it isn't uh, a shift. This has been an ongoing level of report back and engagement that we uh, expect with the work that we've funded through the general fund in support of the activities of uh, GRID and Summer Night Lights. And so uh, subsequent to that, uh, that presentation, uh, we had been in conversations my office uh, about with mayor's office uh, and grid to have regular updates provided to uh, this committee as we had, had as we had discussed previously and I know Mr. McCosker you were part of the budget committees when we were having those conversations and uh, we discussed having the mayor's office come and provide these updates to assess the uh, progress of the program and the work that was being done particularly after I had uh, launched with some of the training that we had done through Project TURN, uh, which was money that we had secured in the 21-22 uh, fiscal year budget cycle. And so my hope was to showcase all of the really good work, valuable work, uh, that I know many of these interventionists are engaged in uh, so that we can talk about what that looks like in the context of our responses in the community. Uh, after that meeting, we attempted to work with the mayor's office to lay out a schedule of three committees for them to join our public safety committee meeting to participate, to provide these updates. And, uh, and the first was supposed to occur at the end of November of last year. Unfortunately, on uh, October 16th, when we reached out to the mayor's office team to begin planning that presentation, as we had previously mutually agreed upon, uh, they were non-responsive. We subsequently followed up again on October 26th. November 2nd and November 8th, and it was, uh, we, were, uh, we were told that uh, they will not be presenting but submitting a written report. We asked them to again clarify on November 14th. They did not respond. We asked again on November 30th and again on December 19th as we were beginning our 2024 planning for this committee, and again, no response. <coughs> Finally, on January 3rd, uh, there was a response with times to meet a meeting was scheduled, then it was canceled at the last moment, not by my office. We asked uh, to send new times over and uh, it took more than a week to get new times uh, responded to us. Uh, that meeting went well. They confirmed that they would be happy to come to committee in February. We asked if they preferred the first or second meeting and if it would be a written or verbal presentation. They indicated that they would get back to us and about 10 days later on January 26, they indicated that it would be a written report at the second meeting in February. On February 14th, they confirmed the 27th was still good and that they would have a written report with a PowerPoint up on all the council file management system by the 20th. We checked back in on the 20th as it approached and they asked for a meeting on the 22nd, which they did not show up for. We pushed them to reschedule the meeting that day due to now tight timeline because we had this scheduled meeting and they indicated that they were no longer willing to report to this committee at any time. My only hope is that as a public safety committee meeting, as a public safety committee for the city and as the steward of uh, resources that are dedicated to serving public safety interests in the city of Los Angeles, that we have the utmost transparency with how dollars are expended, how they are maximized and used, and how they are in alignment with our greater public safety strategies. And this is an opportunity to share the work of the integration of those efforts. Uh, and it's a perfect opportunity to do so in this committee. 
This is currently a over $40 million, nearly $50 million commitment, financial commitment from the City of Los Angeles in our general fund to support these programs. There was, again, the resources that I secured and allocated through the UB in the 21-22 fiscal year budget that provided some very important training to help professionalize and make the work more consistent based on even some of the interventionist work that has been nationally acclaimed in Newark, uh, New Jersey, that I personally, I see uh, uh, Commander Acevedo, uh, Giselle Acevedo, who's, who also uh, joined in that meeting. Uh, there has been a great deal of effort and interest uh, by members of this committee to engage in this conversation. Mr. Bacosker, I know you were among them. And it's why we have invested uh, very earnestly and with great interest to make sure that we are doing so effectively. And it's just with great regret and disappointment that we are not getting the cooperation to provide those responses and that feedback uh, to this committee. We have a responsibility to ensure that taxpayer dollars are expended responsibly and put to good use. There are a number of contracts and work that we need to, meet, we need to assess and ascertain the efficacy, uh, understand what, where there might be gaps so that we can all work collectively to help ensure public safety is achieved in the city of Los Angeles. These are conversations that have been ongoing. This is not new to the committee. We recognize that GRID has been around since 2007. It has been reporting to this committee since, uh, I want to say, about 2021. Previously, it was reporting to uh, Public Works and uh, Public Works Committee uh, in, in when a lot of the contract authorities were occurring. But it was reassigned to public safety appropriately because this is part of our public safety response. And so, uh, again, I'm disappointed, but I'm hopeful that the mayor and, their, and her team will reconsider and uh, provide an instruction to report on these very important programs. They're very important to our communities. We know we have uh, deployment sites throughout the city. And uh, many of you may have noticed, unfortunately, that uh, last week, even when they initially agreed to come and participate in the conversation on the emergency response with uh, Chief Moore, with uh, Chief Crowley and EMD, when we were having a conversation on the response in the aftermath of the, uh, of the storms, uh, they had made a commitment to participate and join and then neglected to uh, show up. So this is a disappointing turn of events that we're starting to, uh, I've discovered a pattern of. and. I'm hopeful and optimistic that we will see a shift in that, that we could have this cooperative uh, partnership to ensure that uh, we are all meeting the needs of our respective communities. And so, um, again, uh, sorry that uh, they're not here to join us and provide this very important report back. Uh, but uh, colleagues, I just wanted to share with you the context and the history of the effort uh, that we have engaged, what my office has engaged in. and. Uh, I even uh, broached this conversation directly with the mayor yesterday uh, and was told very clearly that uh, they would not be coming to uh, report to this committee. And so, uh, so we will unfortunately not be having this discussion item today and uh, we'll hopefully have this uh, scheduled for a future date. Colleagues, are there any questions or comments? Thank you. And so, uh, Mr. Lid, if uh, you would please read item two into the record. Yes. Item number two, Board of Police Commissioners report relative to an all civilian Board of Rights and the effectiveness of ordinance number 186100. Thank you very much. And, uh, and so I believe we have Chief uh, Rim Kunis and Mr. T. Fink. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Rodriguez and other council members. Um, thank you for calling us today. Uh, we're, we're excited and uh, we believe this conversation with the Public Safety Committee is long overdue. Um, we, there were various reports that have been, well first let me make an introduction. Uh, Mr. T. Fink, ex Executive Director of the Board of Police Commissioners to my left, 
I got Lieutenant Javier Sanchez. He is the department advocate, and the assistant department advocate is Detective Mark Furness. So the two gentlemen on my right oversee the border rights process for the Los Angeles Police Department, and they can address and handle any questions that you may have that are particular with the border rights process and the day-to-day -day operations of it. There were various reports that have been submitted. There was an Inspector General's report that was submitted in November of 22, followed by a uh, department letter res response in December of 22, and we have reviewed uh, the motion um, from the council in February of 23 that addresses a lot of the highlights that are contained within those two reports. We are here today to tell you four years later that a lot of the um, information that was in the report prior to Measure C, there was a report that was generated by the CLA, I believe, in 2011 that monitored the Board of Rights process from 11 to 16, and then prior to the implementation of Measure C, and now after four years later, we see a lot of common themes and issues and concerns um, pertaining to leniency. So. Without getting into the full overview of the border rights process, unless you need me to do so, we're here to address any specific questions that you may have and then make a recommendation to the Public Safety Committee from the department on how we feel we can maybe proceed in the best interest of the organization. Sure, so was that the extent of the presentation just to open and then we'll go into questions or did we wanna do any deeper dive? Uh, you know what, I was gonna leave it to you. Um, yeah, no. Please yep. go ahead, and then, I mean, I do have questions, but if you wanna just help provide some context and overview for everyone, I think that would be great. And, sure. And then we can dig into the questions. Okay, sure, so, you know, we have the pre-ordinance civilian examiner, examiner leniency. So the pre-ordinance, the chief legislative analyst prepared a report observing a trend of leniency for civilian hearing examiners. With two plus years of experience, the department has observed results that match this forecasted leniency. Post-ordinance trends in the board election, officers are overwhelmingly pursuing all civilian directed boards. 2019, 62% elected all civilian boards. 2020, 80% or 88% elected all civilian boards. 21, continual pattern upward trend of 91%. And 22, 100% um, who have selected all civilian boards. All civilian boards, Experience is showing all civilian boards render a guilty verdict at approximately the same rate as traditional boards, but all civilian boards are far less likely to terminate an officer. An example, in 2020, the chief of police recommended 18 officers for removal, 12 elected all civilian boards, all 12 were found guilty, but only three of the 12 were actually removed. So when an employee gets sent to a directed board of rights, it starts out with a personnel complaint, gets reviewed by an area division, gets reviewed by a bureau, gets reviewed over professional standards bureau, which is myself and my staff, and then the egregiousness of that case gets presented to the chief of police. The chief of police reviews all evidence regarding that case, and then makes a recommendation um, to terminate, which would be sent to a board of rights. The chief of police does not have the sole authority to terminate an employee, uh, 1070 of the city charter says that the chief of police can only recommend an employee be sent to a board of rights, which is the administrative tribunal that would evaluate the facts of the case and then make a recommendation um, on whether or not that employee should be terminated or not. So there's the difference. An opted board is when an employee may receive a penalty of um, anything up to 22 days and the employee then can opt for the same board of rights process and ask for a reduction or sometimes even a not guilty based on the evidence presented. So those are the two. A directed board is a termination worthy case. An opted board is anything else that an employee may seem, may, may want to challenge. So there's the difference. So as I stated, um, the, the difference, we had 12 elected all civilian boards and all 12 were found guilty, but only three were removed out of 12 was about 25% six elected traditional boards and were found guilty, and four of those, four out of the six were removed. So four out of the six, those were your traditional, prior to uh, June of, of 2019, the Board of Rights process was, um, our hearing examiners were two sworn command staff officers and one civilian. 
that was enacted after 1992. So the border rights process started in from 1930, in 1930, which was led by three sworn members of the police department. In, 19, in 1992, based on a recommendation by the um, uh, Christopher Commission, a civilian member was voted in, it was, I believe it was Measure F in 1992, that um, allowed the board to be convened of two sworn members and one civilian. And then Measure C in 2019, I think it was voted in in 17 and then enacted in June of 2019. Um, an employee had the option to select an all civilian hearing um, examiner to run these boards. So we've identified egregious ample, uh, examples of uh, misconduct for, um, that have been identified where employees have been failed to remove. We have officers that have been um, convicted or of child abuse, false statements, failing to record videotape recordings, um, multiple driving under the influence, and these employees have been found um, um, guilty out of Board of Rights, but given numerous suspension days. The Board of Rights can only give up to 65 days suspension, but employees that we believe that should have been terminated based on the Chief's recommendation, based on the evidence presented, are still employed with the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm here to tell you that the Los Angeles Police Department does not have jobs for individuals with multiple criminal charges that have been found to be lying, that have been found to be involved in various other assault-related, domestic violence type of crimes. One would tell you that there, there is a, there's two sides of this. An employee that has been found guilty of those acts can never testify as a law enforcement officer. We call it essential functions of a law enforcement officer, essential duties, it's a post standard. That employee has to be able to testify in court, has to be able to take reports, has to be able to wor work full duty in uniform in a black and white police car. And these employees, when found guilty of these type of misconduct type of allegations, cannot be put back in the field. And we do not have positions for a full salaried employee to be collecting a check, you know, working in a, in a, in a um, administrative function when they're getting play, paid a police officer's salary. So we do have concern. There's various examples of that. The percentage of folks that are sent to border rights is very, is very, very small. You know, if we have 1.1 million stops and contacts, the percentages are from an employee being sent to a border rights is probably well under 0.3%. So we're looking at a very, very small numbers of individuals that, I'm, that, that we're here talking about today. So that's sort of the background of what I have. Mr. Tifank, did you want to offer anything from your side, from the Board of Police Commissioners? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Richard Tifank, Executive Director of the Board of Police Commissioners. Our role in this is that the Board of Police Commissioners is the entity that uh, selects and hires the members who sit as civilian hearing examiners. Uh, we also are involved in when an officer does make a selection for a, uh, a board, let's say they pick a, a all civilian board. There are, each of the hearing examiners is given a number. They're put into basically a bingo cage. We spin the cage, we pull nine, nine names out. We then give those nine names to the department and the department and the officer's representative have a meeting. There's a flip of a coin and there's a first draw and a scratching of names back and forth until three remain. That's the process of how they are selected. They're selected anonymously. And that process has been in place and that's included in the, ch the city charter as to a process to uh, select the members of the, of the pool. We currently have 68 members of the pool. There are uh, 38 males and 30 females. Um, I will give you a real quick breakdown of their occupations just for your information and background. Uh, lawyers, mediators, administrative law judges, there are 45. Uh, pastors, there are two. Uh, forensic CPA, one. PhDs, there are three, one in education, one in psychology, and one as a professor, two human resource executives, two business owners, one health CEO, one law professor, four retired law enforcement, one architect, one executive director from Los Angeles County, one retired law professor, and one from a finance company as a CEO. That's the breakdown of the group. Demographically, uh, male whites are 24, female whites are 17, male blacks are five, Female blacks are nine, male Hispanics four, female Hispanics two, 
male uh, APIs one, female APIs one, male other one, and female other one. So that's the demographic pool. When Measure C was passed, we put a uh, advertisement out uh, to increase the pool because the fact with uh, going to all civilians, we needed more people. That generated about 165 applications. From that, uh, the Board of Police Commissioners delegated myself and the Inspector General to do the interviews of those individuals. We started those pre-pandemic. Pandemic hits had to shut those down for a period of time. And even the Board of Rights that had to take a break, but then they did come back. They came back virtual until after several months they went back in person. We completed the interviews and when we did our interviews, we would look at individuals who had uh, qualifications that met the, the responsibilities and minimum qualifications of the, the pool, which is shall not have a criminal record or a sustained allegation of misconduct related to the applicant's employment or profession that would impact his or her ability to act impartially as a Board of Rights panel member or conduct an administrative appeal hearing. Should have a record of responsible community service, preferably a resident of Los Angeles. However, since they are city employees, you cannot mandate they live in the city of Los Angeles. Mm. Shall not presently be employed as a peace officer. If a former peace officer, at least five years separation from their last employing agency and prohibited from being selected as a civilian panel member for a period of two years after the effective date of the ordinance, which is June 13th of 2019. So anyone after June 13th of 2021, those four retired law enforcement, they came on after June of 21 because that was the requirements. And then last, should have at least two years experience in human resources, personnel relations, labor relations, or personnel matters relating to recommending, administrating, adjudicating, or reviewing the administrative, administration of discipline. The reason for all that is as part of the hearing process, it's a quasi-judicial hearing. They act as both a juror and a trier of fact, judge and jury, because they have, out of the three, they'll select one to be the chairperson. Uh, typically, it's going to be the senior hearing examiner will be the chairperson. They have informal rules of evidence, but there's rules of evidence. Evidence must be admitted, and so it does take some ab ability to be, quote unquote, a judge. But they do act as the jurors, the triers of fact. They all have, have an equal vote. They will hear all the evidence. They will take testimony from uh, the witnesses presented by the department, witnesses presented by the accused, and the accused if he or she chooses to testify. At the conclusion of that, they will then make a finding. The finding is guilt or innocence. If they find guilt, they then deal with the penalty, and they would then adjudicate the penalty. They have to write a rationale to support their decision for guilt and a rationale to support their decision for the penalty. And that's very briefly an overview of the process of how we get to a, a point where there is a finding of fact by the administrative panel. Thank you. And so, Mr. T, thank you. Indicated that it was. I'm sorry. You when you said you received 165 applications, but it was pre-COVID. Yes. And so, what? So you want to have a pool of what size? Are you have you achieved that scale of pool yet? From, yes, we have. What, okay. what we did from the 165, uh, the Inspector General and I made recommendations to the Board of Police Commissioners in closed session because it is a personnel matter. Mm -hmm. We would recommend individuals, we would give the Board of Police Commissioners an overview of the individual, their responses to the questions we ask, copies of their resumes, and their interest letter. The Board of Police Commissioners is the entity that made the appointment of them as hearing examiners. So from that 165, we increased the pool about 40 people. To the best of my recollection, it's been a number of years, but I believe we increased it about 40 people. A number of them, clearly did not meet the recommendation, the qualifications, and were screened out without even an interview. And then the Inspector General and I did the interview, uh, asked a variety of questions about their background, uh, their ability to uh, understand right and wrong, understand uh, evidence, understand how to uh, write an uh, a, um, adjudication letter and do those kinds of things and understand the personnel process of what we're talking about, human resources. That's why that was a criteria. Somebody who doesn't have that background and knowledge, it really impedes their ability to totally grasp the evidence presented by the department and also by the, the officer's defense. Got it. Um, so how many current uh, pending cases do we have before the Board of Rights, Chief? 106. And so, and, and have all of them opted for the uh, full civilian? Yes. 
Okay. So it's so 100% since um, 2022 have all been civilian. Uh, si so, so since the adoption of. So it, so in June of 19, and then everything after. I believe there was a few traditional in 19, but 20, 21, 22, 20, and 23 have all been civilian. And that's in, and that's both directed and opted wards. Okay. And um, you know, I know Mr. McCosker. You, I'm sure you have questions, um, but it was, and I don't want to, I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, but I know you were advocating for lawyers uh, in last year's budgets, uh, in last year's budget to help with the level, kind of leveling of the playing field. Um, could you inform us whether or not those positions have been filled? Yes, they have. They they were filled this year, which is great. Um, thank you. You know, thank you to the city attorney's office. Thank you for the recommendation. The city attorneys are partnering up with the department advocates. We have four with one supervisor, so they have come on board in January, and uh, they're 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 starting to get actively involved in cases and sitting with the advocates for for various things and training. So it's it's working out. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it on over to you, Mr. McCosker. Thank, thank you. you very much. I appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. That's exactly where I wanted to go. So. You know, with all sciences, including social sciences like this, there are a lot of variables, tons of variables. And in this analysis, uh, going all the way back to the CLA's report and then including the, the two-year report, there are variables that include the chief, how the chief charges, you know, how it runs up through the process. There's variables on who the uh, defense attorneys are in the process and a gigantic variable is who presents the case. I think that's extraordinarily important to me. So I think you, you gave part of the answer, but right now who is, over the last several years, and including today, since we, our lawyers are observing and acclimating themselves, who's presenting the city's case, the chief's case? So Lieutenant uh, Javier, so Lieutenant Javier uh, Sanchez oversees the department advocates, and there's six department advocates, so he can explain to you the process, um, we have six sergeants that put on the department's case. Can you, t thank you very much. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the, that job function, not those individuals, but that job function? Right, so uh, w once a case comes over to uh, the advocate section, it's assigned to a specific associate advocate um, that would put on the board of rights. They own the case. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they, um, they work with the defense to get the, the case scheduled and to set up a, a board date. Once the board is set, they are the ones that are gonna, in, um, they essentially uh, speak for the chief of police to represent the department at the border rights. They present evidence, they do opening arguments, opening statements, they call in witnesses, they, they prepare witnesses before um, the border rights to ensure that they understand um, the, their role in the border rights. Um, they also, um, they also uh, commonly, uh, like, like a lawyer would object in the case, uh, they call out um, department witnesses to uh, to uh, put on the best case, if we find a, if there's a guilty verdict, they would call, we would call like a, the risk manager to speak on mm -hmm. um, the risk factors to the city, negative retention, uh, and then they would also do penalty arguments. Uh, it, this is all outlined in the Board of Rights Spaniel, so the right. Board of Rights Spaniel is what kind of guides um, how they put on the case. So they're LAPD sworn officers, poli uh, LAPD personnel. They're all LAPD supervisors, so they're both either Sergeant 2, Sergeant 1s, or Detective 2s, which is a LAPD supervisor. Is there any requirement, do any of them have any legal background? Are any of them lawyers or have legal training? No. None at all. Is there training that they do when they come into the unit? Yeah, so there is training that we provide, um, myself and my assistant officer in charge. Uh, we provide uh, training as far as uh, doing mock boards, so we'll in, um, put on a mock case as far as how to introduce evidence, what a border rights is, make sure that they understand how someone gets to a border rights, um, how to do objections, how to do opening arguments, how to in, um, prepare witnesses for the case. Do they have the ability when they look at it, when they get the file, knowing that it's gone up, well, you know, up and down the chain of command, when they get to look at a file, can they look at it and say, you know what, I think this case is is problematic because and make modifications that's the that's my expectation I expect every uh, associate advocate to do a deep dive and actually understand the case better than the, than the investigator it's common that they will bring issues to me if there's issues with the case which I bring up to my chain of command and in some cases we do settle settle those boards 
on and, and go back to the chief of police report our, our uh, findings and uh, sometimes the boards do get settled in that way because of what the associate advocates do and uh, identify issues uh, specifically to, to that board of rights. You know, sir, if I can just add to that too, we do work a lot with the police general counsel. And so when it is time for a board of rights to be put on and there's various issues and things that come up, they obviously run it through me, but we, we do work with the city attorney's office in regards to um, settling the case. So it's not done very frequent, but that is an option. I know last year, Chief Moore withdrew, I believe, three boards of rights based on new evidence that was brought forward by the department advocates. So it is something that is looked at. It is something that we pay attention to. But an understanding when it does get to a board of rights, unless some, some outlier fact of information comes to light, these cases, they're very, very small, but to send someone to a board of rights, directed board of rights, is pretty significant and mm -hmm. they're pretty egregious acts of misconduct that these employees have engaged in to get themselves to that fact. Yeah, and one of my, one of my observations and concerns would be if it has gone from the chief and gone through the whole you know, chain of command, and I know there's lots of folks that touch it and look at it, which is good, but then when it makes it to a sergeant who without legal training, which is no fault of the sergeants, in fact, it's probably, probably a better human being if you don't have legal training, um, that's a tough moment to look everybody in the eye and say, I disagree. It's probably even a tougher moment for that sergeant, and I'm, this is not a question, tougher moment for that sergeant than it is for the command officer uh, who sits on a board. Um, on the other side of the case, the defense lawyer, or the defense, is it always lawyers? Yes, it's always lawyers. Is it always lawyers who are, you know, in the business of doing defense for police officers in employment matters? Yeah, so it's, there's a panel of attorneys uh, hired by the Police Protective League. That's who uh, normally um, is, are the defense attorneys representing the department, uh, the, the, representing the officer at the Board of Rights. Yeah. Do we have any, where are we, okay, so we have a really good cop, a sergeant, a supervisor uh, who does this pretty regularly on one side and we have a, a defense lawyer, a lawyer on the other side. Um, where are we with the, I think it's seven attorneys and a couple of, a couple of paralegals, right, that we, are, that we have authorized to bring into the process. Have any of them brought any cases yet? Or, yeah, brought any cases yet? So, sir, we, we have four city attorneys. We had two that were brought on board in January. Yeah. And then we just brought on two additional with a supervising attorney. They're also doing other work, per se. Right. But have any of them brought a case? Have we had any of them uh, you know, present a board case? So we've had uh, actually several boards of rights where they've been the second chair. They've, they've, they've crossed uh, witnesses. They've been there with the associate advocate. They've um, questioned witnesses. They've um, actually argued motions on behalf of the department. Uh, there's been uh, at least two boards of rights that that's occurred. You know, sir, if I can also add two to the process, I believe the question has never been about guilty. So employees are found guilty mm -hmm. 90 plus percent of the time. Right. It's the penalty. It's the penalty that is the difficult challenge for folks to terminate an employee, to give a, a extenuating you know, penalty. And I believe the city attorneys have added the in-depth knowledge. And we have to remember, this is an administrative tribunal. It's not the court of law. The rules of evidence don't apply. It's, this is, let's get to the truth. Everything's on the table. Everything can be evaluated from you know, the moment that incident happened all the way up through everything that was discovered in the investigation. And what these have turned into are criminal court proceedings with motions and things that really are not even allowable, per se, based on the Board of Rights Manual. This is a, this is a truth. We're trying to get to the truth and the department advocate who is a trained sergeant in investigations, mm -hmm. takes the case and puts it on to their ability to, art, to, to put forward the, all the evidence that the department has to these hearing examiners that are there to make a judgment on mm -hmm. whether or not the department has held its case to a preponderance. Mm -hmm. And that's all this is. And that's where the challenge is and where we're trying to find the balance you know, with all the entities involved. I, I think for the amount of, may, may I, Madam Chair? Well, I'm sorry, what was May it? I continue? For of course, a moment? of course, go ahead. I think for the, for the um, with the request that came in for the city attorney services and the paralegal backup, and I do think the positions are seven and two, so I think we haven't gotten to full hiring yet. I think we were acknowledging all of that, that, that these cases uh, are important and the city needs representation 
just as the officer does. And so I think what we were looking at is sort of high, uh, raising the bar. And I don't mean to, to denigrate the efforts of the officers, uh, uh, but raise the bar on what is the city's case and have a sort of a fairer fight with defense counsel on the other side. And I also think when you, whether you have one, two, or three civilians involved, I think that it is a different language. My sense is that civilians, even with the expertise that, that, that was described to us, civilians are looking to see what is the evidence, you know, how does the evidence stack up, what are the exonerating circumstances, what are the circumstances that make sense. And there is very often in, the, in any shared profession a shorthand. And I think that, I, I think that civilians are going to respond to what evidence lawyers are giving them. That would be my sense. And I want to have, I will turn to a question now. Have we, have you had experience, and now I'm, I'm looking to Mr. Tfank, have we had experience of looking at a case, and this is a, I don't know the answer to this question, so I'm asking a question I don't know the answer to, where you believe there was just an absolute abuse of, abuse of discretion or abuse of process by the civilian board? I would say not abuse of discretion. I would say a decision that would be one that I would not make based on the evidence presented to me. I think that you could call it an abuse of discretion. I would just say they see it different. And I think it gets back to the point that the chief is making. It's hard for somebody to take someone's job from them. And I think it's hard for a civilian to do that also. And what's missing? Missing is having the experience of a, of a of a command officer on that panel? What's missing? I would defer to, uh, to my colleagues here, but from my perspective and talking to hearing examiners who used to be yeah. on boards of rights with two command officers and one civilian, what they will tell you is missing, that the command officer could give the perspective of a sworn officer based on the incident and the evidence they're seeing that the three civilians would not have. Mm -hmm. They don't have that experience of being in a radio car or making those kind of calls or decisions. That's where they would look to a command officer to give them that kind of input. That's one of the things that I hear from the civilians who served previously on the, what we'll call the traditional board of two sworn and one civilian. They don't have that today. And do you think, uh, do you think of, uh, a prosecuting attorney, if you will, the attorney putting up the city's case couldn't provide that sort of insight? I think they can match the, the level of the defense for the officer more in certain situations than one of our sworn individuals could. Uh, that's that's yeah. my, my opinion. I think that they can argue a case from a different perspective mm -hmm. than our sworn personnel can, and I think that's the benefit we'll hopefully see with the, with the attorneys being there, Thanks. you know, prosecuting the cases, so to speak. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very heard. much. Appreciate all you. Oh, sir, I'd like to be heard. Yep. Well, um, it's up to the chair. Sure, of course, go ahead. Thank you. Again, I'm Detective Mark Furness. I've been with the Advocate Section since 2016, and I've been the Detective 3, which makes me the assistant officer in charge since 2019. Um, oftentimes, when I didn't have a lieutenant as they promote, I have also acted as the officer in charge, so I've been there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say, um, out of all respect, a lot of the assumptions you're making are incorrect regarding the um, the ability of the advocate versus the attorney. Obviously, if we are in a court of law, the, the non-trained advocates would not have the ability to argue against an attorney, but as stated, this is not a court of law. This is an administrative tribunal. Mm -hmm. uh, the advocates, once they're trained, they are very successful, and the, our stats show that. We wouldn't be getting guilty verdicts 90% of the time if we weren't equipped or had the ability to argue against attorneys. We do. My advocates argue boards more often than most attorneys will ever see a courtroom. Mm -hmm. They are very good at it. The problem we've been having is the penalty, and that is very specifically because of the civilian boards. Now, when the civilian boards came in, in um, when they made the amendment to bring the civilian boards in, mm -hmm. the one group that was not addressed about their opinion on this was the civilians. Once the, all the hearing examiners became all civilian boards, I would speak to them frequently, and they were very concerned about not having sworn personnel up there. Mm -hmm. All of them, except for one, um, all felt they needed at least one sworn, if not two sworn members up there, because they don't understand how the department works. 
that's the way the administrative tribunal has to work is there should be the experience up there. That's why it was always three sworn until 1992. I also, I, oftentimes I make the, uh, use the metaphor of, imagine if we were judging pilots. You would want three pilots up there trying to decide if they're doing the right thing in the cockpit. Not, not an architect and two arbitrators. They would have no idea what's going on. And that's essentially what we're seeing now. So we're able to prove the case, oftentimes successfully. We get to the penalty and they just don't want to remove these employees or they don't want to discipline them. Um, you asked if there was some abuse of power. I would say there's definitely been some of that. We've had cases where the officers were accused of falsely arresting somebody and then perjuring themselves in court about it. The board ultimately found them not guilty. And when we um, debriefed the board afterwards, they said, well, yeah, we felt they were lying on the stand, but we thought they were nice guys. This is not the type of o civilian oversight that the city wants from their c civilians. We need to have some sworn representation back up there. I appreciate that. Typically, when, when someone says, with all due respect, they mean the opposite. And so <laughs> I, I think it came out exactly that way. Um, if what you said is true, then in every malpractice case, we would have a jury entirely of doctors. Uh, and in every grand jury, we would have folks that are all defense or, defense or criminal attorneys. So everything you said is completely untrue. It really is up to, it really is up to the presenting officer on a case to be able to, that, that, that individual has to be able to present the city's case and also provide information about why this is important. Um, you guys have all done a pretty good job of explaining why it's important. I mean, I would suggest maybe you do that for, the, for these hearings. Sir, if I could just close on this one statement. You know, we do have uh, the director of the Office of the Constitutional Policing, Director Liz, Liz Rhodes. We do call her in along with her team, you know, to talk about, you know, I use the, the words essential functions of a law enforcement officer. When we have officers that have been found guilty of these various violations, they can't testify. They can't be put in a car anymore. And we tell the hearing examiners that. We, we go in great depth to tell them that. And so you're left with an employee collecting a pretty good paycheck that can't work the field, that can't do anything. And so when you have an employee, multiple cases of that, it, it causes a problem you know, for the organization. No, I understand. I understand yeah. the problem. Remember, I worked in the city attorney's office. I mean, I know, I know what it was like to have folks unable to testify in our cases. Sure. And I understand the challenge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to go in the order. I'm going to start with Mr. Soto Martinez and then uh, Ms. Park and then Mr. Lee. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to just appreciate the, the conversation that we're having here. Um, we're having very respectful disagreement. Uh, and in that vein, uh, I, I couldn't agree with Mr. Finesse the, more. Uh, Look, I, I, just some, sort of my, my background. Uh, I, I worked at a union for 16 years where I was the, the organizer that defended people who were being disciplined left and right. The people that do this work every single day are way more trained than an attorney that comes in and deals with the cases one off one. I mean, these folks are experts. And not only do they have expertise on this subject, but they have institutional knowledge. Once you've been in the department for a certain amount of time, you see, you have the precedent, you know you can compare case to case. Uh, you can see the trend, the historical trend. You can see all of that. And that's something an attorney will never have, the institutional knowledge. And so, in my perspective, it sounds like those are the kind of folks that have been dealing with these cases. They will, I, I repeat, an attorney coming out of this will never have the same level of understanding of the department, the institutional knowledge, and the history of discipline than the folks who have been in doing this in the department for, for, for the IPD. So I, I just wanna be and like, just put that out there. I like, completely agree with, with what you just said. Um, and one of my questions was gonna be, what is the most egregious things you've seen that people are still working? And you, and you sort of said it, someone who per falsely incarcerated someone and perjured themselves. That is a flaw of the people making the decision. I think it's, and, and you can probably give more examples of, of egregious acts. It is the people making the decisions that is, that is incorrect here, is the all civilian board. And so it's not about trying to 
find ways to level the playing field. The playing field is flawed. Outrightly, it's just flawed. And so, I, I, that's, that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. Not a question, it's a statement, uh, but it, it, it just really, it makes me very angry to hear that uh, we have police officers that have done that and are still working. Because at the end of the day, regardless of ideology and all these things, what we're trying to find is fairness. That's it. And, and that is something that I learned in the union. It's like, look, I had a lot of workers that did a lot of bad stuff, and I still defend them because that was my job. But I told them, we're here to find what's fair. And you're probably going to lose this case because I think you, I think you did it wrong. You did something wrong, right? And it's, and it's very clear, it's abundantly clear that this system is not fair. Uh, it, it, is, it is being taken advantage of uh, so much that now it's not even a coin flip, it's 100%. Uh, they're, they're deciding because they know it's more lenient. And, you know, and, and the person who makes the decision is, a, I believe, is the person who's defending the guilty person, right? Is that who makes the decision where to go to all civilian or the traditional border rights? It's up to the it's up to the individual officer um, what they yeah, prefer, but it's it's um, it's based on their attorney's you know advice. But it's 100 percent of the time it's all civilians. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. yeah. So it's of course they're going to go there 100. percent I mean we don't even have to we don't have to go m more than that. It's just how are guilty how are people that are being uh, put up for egregious acts most likely to be terminated? What are they deciding to do? That's all we need to know. They're going for the Office of Board because they know it's more lenient. It, 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 we lose anything after that, I think, is, it is irrelevant. Uh, just, I do have one question, actually. How many folks do we, first of all, the other thing that I was very bothered by is that they can't, you can't even use them in their full capacity anymore. You see, uh, uh, the chief said, you, you, can't, you can't even testify anymore. So, they're, so we're, what are we, how many folks are we talking about in the department that are in this position? So there's, we check there, there's a committee, there's, there's, a, there's a committee that we evaluates employees, so I think we're at 68 employees. Um, and from, from a various years that have various different levels of what they can and can't do, but the cases that we're talking about, when you're found guilty of false statements um, for a criminal act, you know, you can't go in the field. Uh -huh. So, so what, are, what are they doing? Various administrative duties, you know, within the station. And that's a good question. Um, one were to say we have all these jobs, you can't put them at the front desk because they can't answer the phone, they can't take a report, they can't interview victims because their testimony is now tainted. There's the Brady issue, you know, for, regarding testimony. Um, so, so there's various factors that, that fall into play and you really have them as a, you know, making copies and, and, and just doing Getting various coffee? administrative duties. I mean, it's sad to say, I, I'm embarrassed to even say that, but but when you have an employee that comes back to the workplace, it's hard to find a job to justify a, a Los Angeles police officer's full, full duty salary to be able to do that. that that's, not, that's not what they're here for. And how much, how much money are we talking about? Like, like a year? Do we have, do we have that, those figures? Like Whatever, I mean, there's various ranks. It's more predominantly in the officer ranks. So that prob probably close to $100,000, $125,000, depending on on your position of what you're doing in the organization. We have different offenses. I mean, we have command staff that get involved in various types of, of acts like this, but it's, but it's not to the level. So it varies, it varies. So let me understand. So 68 people making copies, making coffee, came in and interact with the public. And do we know how long these folks are gonna stay on the department? Do we have an average, uh, average year, uh, average tenure? Because if they just started, they're going to be there for, that's a pretty chill job for the next 30 years until they get the full pension and then go retire. So, so without doing a deep dive, so I sit on the, on, on the committee that evaluates based on my position at Professional Standards Bureau. Um, so over the last probably three years, I would say the average time on the job is between 10, 10 to 12 years, maybe 10 to 15. So if you're looking at a 25-year career, you know, um, there are cases where folks can come out if they're not found guilty of false statements and things that would preclude you from testifying per se. But today we're talking about you know the current cases where folks have been sent to these directed border rights that have been found to Detective Furness's point. You know that's one case. He has many many others. Um, not guilty or guilty with significant penalty days, suspension days. That regardless of the penalty, you still can't work in the field. 
and yeah. you can't do what we need you to do based on our deployment and everything else that's going on. Wow, that's incredibly shocking. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a, a quick follow-up. The 68 that you indicated, is that just since the shift in, uh, so this is just, for, this is even preceding that? So I don't have the numbers per se from, from 2019, how many folks have been entered into our, our REMAX system. I'm just giving you an overall rough Got number it. since the inception, and this is probably within the last probably 23 years maybe, or maybe a little bit less. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Park. Just a couple quick questions. Um, Thank you so much for all of the work that has gone into this and the very thoughtful um, discussion about it. So I, I just wanted to offer some observations and then get your, your input on it. You know, when an allegation is made against an, an officer, you go through your investigative process, make a decision about whether those allegations are sustained or not, then it gets transmitted to the chief who does his review. But it's not until the entire case is presented in, in adver adversarial way until it goes to Board of Rights. And one of the things that struck me in reading the reports back on this is that we're looking at these leniency trends and assuming that our Board of Rights commissioners know what the Chief's recommendation was and we're assuming that they should reach the same outcome when we know that they are being presented with different and additional evidence, including things like subject matter experts, letters of support, evidence of rehabilitation, or anything that can be considered mitigating or aggravating factors. And we've also learned now that there's also the presentation of character evidence. And so there is all of this new information that's being presented that potentially could explain while we're seeing penalties that don't line up. It's not that they're reaching a different outcome on guilt or innocence, it's the penalty. And as I went through the reporting, I'm seeing in many of these cases, severe discipline, 65 day suspensions without pay, 20, 22 day suspensions without pay. They are implementing serious discipline. So my questions are one, are they aware of what the chief's recommendation is on punishment? And two, what are your thoughts about how the expansion of what material is being presented and evaluated at the Board of Rights level just may be different in account for the discrepancy in outcomes. So uh, as far as uh, the board understanding, yeah, we, we do give uh, updates to the hearing examiners as far as um, why officers are being sent to board. So a hearing examiner knows once it's a directed board, it's, it's for removal. And uh, they know that going in because it's, it's a directed board. So they know that that's the chief's uh, dis, um, wishes to have that employee removed because they no longer, um, at least the chief lost confidence, they can no longer perform the central duties of a police officer in the department. As far as the opted boards, uh, once the officer is found guilty, uh, the, the board is giving, given um, the, the recommended penalty. And they are um, they're given like, w whether it be uh, suspension days, how many suspension days, and the department will argue uh, as far as to penalty and why that penalty is appropriate. Only that in, um, when we're doing re removal boards, we also bring in the risk manager to testify about the department's you know, concern about liability should that employee remain and also talk about Brady issues. So they are fully versed on um, what the recommendations are. Okay, all right, thank you, that, that helps clarify. Um, one other question, at the Board of Rights level, one of the things that we read about was you know, the sort of question about do we need written briefing and how extensive does legal analysis need to be on admissibility of evidence and things like that. Who's advising on <laughs> offering legal advice on what evidence is admissible? Which I, I understand these are intended to be informal-ish. So, uh, most <laughs> I would say uh, most of our boards are based on policies and procedures uh, with LAPD. So that that is that is basically basically with the officers being charged, and we bring in those policies and procedures. But we do have a city attorney that we always consult with, and and the the board. Um, the hearing examiners also have their own city attorney. If there's any questions about the board procedures, I'll go in and clarify, but otherwise they could consult with their own, with their city attorney, so they do have counsel. You know, and if I can just add it, uh, Mr. Tfink, uh, we provided training last year and we updated our Board of Rights manual that, that spells a lot of these things out for what they can and can't do, and, it's, and it explains a lot of how to, from, from the moment you're picked as the chairperson of the board with the other members of the board, of what to do, what not to do, and it goes 
you know, it's a pretty extensive manual that, that gives in great detail explains your roles, responsibilities, what you can factor in and what you can't. So we've tried to, and then I think uh, Mr. Tifan can talk about a handbook that he developed because of your, because of what you're talking about, ma'am just to give as much insight as we can to the folks sitting at, you know, working as hearing examiners, all the information they need to be successful and evaluate the, the evidence that has come before them. So we, we did over the last year implement those two, I believe, that have been very helpful and beneficial. Which is why I just take a brief pause in reaching a conclusion that it's because these commissioners are not trained or not capable of doing this work. We look for diverse backgrounds and perspectives and appointing people across a wide array of different things that we do here in the city. And so I just wanted to ask that to illustrate really that there's new and different information that we may hear at those level, at that level of proceeding. Sure. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you gentlemen very much. It was very helpful to get a deeper dive into all of this. and get a better understanding of the history and, and how this has all evolved. And uh, so really appreciate all of, your, uh, all of your insight. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Lid, uh, I'd like to uh, note and file this report as it's uh, informational only. Very good. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. And now that brings us to item 21. Excuse me, say again. 21. Very good. Item 21 is a motion, Soto Martinez, McOsker, Krikorian, relative to modifying the structure and function of the Board of Rights and related matters. Thank you very much. And so typically, obviously, in a motion, we wouldn't have a discussion that has yet to be adopted and be uh, processed. Um, I understand uh, we have a unique situation here, given that we had the preceding presentation uh, before us. And uh, I don't know if anyone had any questions, but. Uh, before that, I do want to offer some amendments. Uh, Mr. Lid, I know you have those amendments. Uh, I do. If you would kindly read them into the record that I'd like to propose and, uh, and ensure that they're uh, okay with the authors of the motion. So, Mr. Lid, if you would please uh, read those amendments into the record. Okay. Very good. For the motion, uh, it's to be amended to read as follows. In the first moving clause, I therefore move that the City Council request that the City Attorney prepare and present a draft ordinance repealing Division 22, Chapter 11, Article 12 of the Los Angeles Administrative Code entitled, quote, Alternative Composition of Border Rights, unquote. The draft ordinance shall only go into effect upon voters approving a ballot measure that modifies Section 1070 of the Los Angeles City Charter and be placed under Council file 23-0187-S1. Second moving clause, I further move that the City Council request the Chief Legislative Analyst with the assistance of the City Attorney, City Clerk, Los Angeles Police Department, the Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department, and any other department to report back in 30 days on recommendations and implementation plans to modify Section 1070 of Los Angeles City Charter through various options subject to their compliance with all applicable labor and employee relation laws, which should include, but are not limited to, alternative models for the Board of Rights, including modified composition of civilian and sworn personnel serving on a board, authorizing the Chief of Police to terminate officers immediately, parens, prior to a Board of Rights or other due process proceeding, parens, in appropriate cases as to be determined by the severity of the misconduct, incorporating binding arbitration as a component of the discipline process in termination cases where appropriate, and with all the reports for this, to be placed under Council File 23-0187-S2. Third moving clause, I further move that City Council request that the Board of Police Commissioners report on ways to expand the pool of qualified candidates for civilian hearing examiners in a manner which should include, but is not limited to, 
adding nominating agencies to include local clergy, civil rights organizations, the Office of the Inspector General, requiring the inclusion of civilians with diverse experiences and perspectives, eliminating the criteria requiring years of experience in mediation, arbitration, or similar work, prohibiting individuals who are current or former employees of local law enforcement agencies from serving as civilian hearing examiners, and requiring and providing training from community-based experts and independent experts on police discipline and oversight for all panelists on issues the board routinely considers, such as excessive force and domestic violence, with all responses in this report to be placed under Council File 23-0187-S3. Fourth moving clause, I further move the City Council request that the Board of Police Commissioners and the Office of the Inspector General, with the assistance from the City Attorney, city administrative officer to report back in 90 days and in one year on the status of the transition to attorney prosecutors in lieu of sworn personnel as advocates to present the city's case for discipline outcomes to date for all cases that have used the city attorney. These reports shall be replaced, placed rather, under council file 23-087-S4. Fifth moving clause, I further move that the City Council request the Office of the Inspector General with the assistance of the Chief Legislative Analyst and the, human right, and the Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department to report back in 90 days on additional recommendations for affirmatively furthering Angelina's rights to further misconduct by law enforcement and for increasing accountability when such misconduct occurs with these reports to be placed under Council File 23-0187-S5. Thank you, Mr. Litt. I know that was a mouthful. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Are there any uh, comments or? I have a question. Yes, Mr. I would like to second Mr. your amendments, okay. but I have a question Thank first, you. or I can do it after. Okay. But just to be clear, in the first moving clause, the draft ordinance or the ordinance which is to replace would only go into effect upon the voters approving a ballot measure that modifies Section 1070. I'm sorry, so the, in the first moving clause, I mean your yes, first moving based clause, on, upon the approval. Okay, so the, so the ordinance would go into effect after we get the approval from the voters on the modification. Correct. I'd like to second all your amendments. Thank you. Mr. Soto-Martinez, did you have any? No, no questions. I, for, well, let me just make some comments and then uh, just thank you for, for hearing both of these items today. I think it was very informative for, for us here and the public and anyone who is interested in this. Um, you know, I think the original moving clause was to start repealing it now, but I, I do, after hearing the testimony today, I, I do understand we gotta have something in its place if the voters decide to get rid of it. Uh, so um, I think nothing stops us from coming back to this if it doesn't succeed, but I think uh, I would also be happy accepting these amendments. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And you. I, you know, again, uh, it's difficult all around, and we're trying to create a fair and balanced process uh, that is responsible in making sure that uh, you know we honor the, the honor and respect uh, the labor practice, but of course also making sure that uh, you know we have uh, we have to approach this all responsibly. And I know the goal of this department is to make sure that everyone that wears that badge uh, does so honorably and uh, with the right. Uh, making sure that we have the composition of, of uh, maintaining that level of integrity in this process. So uh, we appreciate everybody. And with that, Mr. Lid, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your second to the amendments. Mr. Lid, if you would please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Matter is approved yeah. as amended. Thank you very much. And uh, now, Mr. Litt, if you would please call item five. Thank you all. Item number five LAPD reports relative to the first and second quarter interim homeless housing fund status reports for fiscal year 2023 24. This matter has also been referred to the Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee. Thank you very much, Commander. Good to see you. Good to see you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, council members and staff. 
Um, Ma'am, if you'd like, I can get started. Please, go ahead and okay, uh, to, go into Okay, to my place. left, I'd just like to introduce my staff. To my left is Officer Hung Ma. To my right is Lieutenant Damian Velasco, and next to him is Officer Kevin Chum. And these individuals work with me in the Homeless Coordinator's Office for the department. Um, so I am Commander Giselle Espinoza, and I'm the department's uh, new Homeless Coordinator. Um, I am here to speak on the Interim Homeless Housing Fund for Quarters 1 and Quarters 2. And just to set, set a backdrop, Quarter 1 is from July 2nd, 2023 to October 7th, 2023, and Quarter 2 is from October 8th to December 30th of 2023. Um, the city, just to give a little background, the City Council allotted a budget of $8.3 million in overtime to staff interim homeless housing and other details associated therewith. The department distributed the funds in the form of overtime hours based on the hourly rate of $94.62 for a total of 88,353 hours. Each council district received 1,000 hours for each ABH site in its district, which amounted to 27,000 hours for 27 sites collectively. The remaining 61,353 hours were distributed evenly among the 15 council districts. From that total, the percentage of the council district area in a particular division determined the number of hours allotted to each division for that particular council district's use. In quarter one, 336 CARE Plus operations were staffed with the funds. In quarter two, 438 CARE operations were staffed with the IHHS fund for a total of 774 operations. As of February 10th, 2023, I'm sorry, 2024, the department has used 60,120 hours with 28,232 hours remaining. So I am available for any questions that anyone may have. I know this is nuanced and a lot of variables, yeah. um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I want to start with the Insight Safe because uh, on, in Homelessness Committee last week, um, it wasn't clear to me in terms of what the CAO was tracking for overtime use, and so I appreciate getting uh, your input on this. Uh, in the report for the first quarter, it indicated that there were 228.7 hours that were used for Inside Safe. Yes, ma'am. And so, has that money been fully reimbursed by Inside Safe? Yes, for quarter one and quarter two, both of those uh, totals have been reimbursed. For quarter two, um, well they, it had not been reimbursed when the report was drafted, but Got it has so since that's why been it wasn't reimbursed. Reflected. And I think the, the uh, thought process behind that was um, <coughs> our chief of police wanted to streamline our over overtime coding, and um, they wanted one code for anything regarding homelessness. So I'm, that, sorry, I can, I'm sorry, can you repeat that So again? to streamline the process, the reason why Inside Safe is coming out of uh, that overtime fund and then reimbursed is because at the chief's uh, direction, he wanted to streamline the process and just have anything homeless related coming out of one overtime code. Okay, but then you guys are also kind of, you know, whether it's ABH related or inside safe related, it's kind of- Absolutely, 100%. Like a subcategory, yes. if you will. We have tracking mechanisms and quite frankly, inside safe has been uh, very expeditiously in reimbursing us. Terrific. <coughs> and, um, When is it determined? Uh, when is it determined that uh, overtime is going to be utilized for a Care Plus operation? So there's a lot of different scenarios for that, but the most important one and the primary one is after the deployment period has been established and the days off have been posted for our uh, sworn personnel, um, that schedule is good for 28 days. So. The care plus and the care and care plus schedules come out after that, or they come before. However, you want to look at it, um, but the the periods don't jive. So if it's a pre-planned um, care plus operation that that was initiated 28 days or more before the date, then if there are uh, on-duty senior lead officers that can staff that, then we'll use that. But most of them happen either a week or two in advance. Um, sometimes they call the same day in the morning, to be honest. Right. Um, and so the, that's when uh, we use our on-duty resources. But other than that, um, we kind of give discretion to the people uh, that are using the fund to work with the council district in collaboration 
uh, and that will determine if it's going to be overtime or on duty. Now, some divisions have exhausted their allotted um, allowance, so what I'm doing is making sure that there is no drop in service and that that division makes those senior lead officers um, available to respond to those details um, as if they were working the overtime. Got it. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, explanation. Um, have there been any Care Plus operations that have been conducted in coordination with an inside safe operation? Um, not, how, I've, I'm fairly new to the position. Okay. I am not aware of any. I, I, I have my staff here that can um, answer if they know of any, but I don't recall ever seeing a Care Plus happen with an inside safe. Usually, inside safe will work with sanitation. They come in after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not very difficult to tell because we have Care Plus uh, details more frequent than Insight Safe. So Insight Safe is very uh, limited to the mayor's office and the people they use uh, to execute that, to affect that. Okay. And then uh, for the first quarter, 22,570 hours were used on uh, the 835 detail. On, I'm sorry. Can you it says uh, on uh, oh, the so last page, oh, 22,570? Correct. Yes, those are the hours total that were used um, by those different divisions for the 835 details. So yeah, what are those details? Like what is that? Uh, so those details can be anything from Care Care Plus, um, any other activity or anomaly or nuance that we see that has an access to um, persons experiencing homelessness or encampments thereof. Uh, back in honor about October 20th of 2023, um, the council adopted a report that outlines uh, several bullet points on when that fund can be used. And we make sure that we are working within those parameters. Um, there are, and I will add that there are some council districts that are not, um, uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of interaction with in terms of the cleanups and things like that. So in those cases, um, when there is an encampment and just about every, every division has it, all 21 divisions have problematic encampments that are not necessarily um, for persons experiencing homelessness, like truly. They are, you know, narcotics areas, narcotics activity, prostitution, and things like that. So, when that occurs and there's a nexus to the violent crime or the overall crime picture of that division, including property crime, uh, but you know our priority is violent crime, then we make sure that the fund is used for those types of uh, activities if the captain of that division uh, sees fit. So there are some divisions that are using it uh, more frequently than others, um, and the others have plans uh, to use to use some of it as we get closer to summer months. So. One of the things that I'm confident about is that they're not, they're not willy-nilly spending the, uh, the funds on things that are not uh, justified. And that's kind of, you know, be, me wanting to be a good steward of the people's money, of course. Um, we're making sure that we're holding them accountable, not only to the crime that's directly related to homelessness, because if they're not using the fund, then that tells me that they don't have hom homeless crime mm -hmm. or homeless problems in their, in their divisions or there aren't people in need of services and a place to live. So it's a double-edged sword. So um, that is kind of to the degree that we monitor this with and we work within the guidelines that have been set forth um, with the council and the council districts and the rest of our city partners. Thank you very much. You're very much. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Now. Colleagues, are there any questions? No, seeing none. Thank you so much, Commander. Thank you uh, all very much. Thank Appreciate you, your time. Uh, Mr. Lid, uh, for item five, I'd like to note and file both reports dated January 31st, uh, 2024, as they're both uh, for informational purposes only. If you'd please call the roll. Very good. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. And now that brings us to item number six with, uh, that I know Mr. Soto Martinez, you had questions on. I do, just a few. Yeah, Mr. Lid, if you please call item six. Yeah. Right. LAPD report relative to the 2023 annual equipment report pursuant to California Assembly Bill 481. This is continued from February 13, 2024. 
Thank you. Hi, Commander. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Rodriguez, Council Members. As you may recall, I'm Commander Schifatelli of the Office of Constitutional Policing and Policy. I was here in September. I presented the department's second annual AB 481 equipment, military equipment report at that time. Uh, this would have been the second report that the department has uh, submitted to you subsequent to the passage of the law in 2021. <clears throat> As you know, the report includes vehicles, ammunition, equipment, and we weapon systems that per the law are defined as military equipment. Costs of acquisition, maintenance, training, storage, et cetera, are also included in that report. We included those as a total amount in that report that was submitted to you. During the September meeting, Council Member uh, Soto Martinez requested an additional breakdown of the expenses for vehicles over $200,000. And that is what we've submitted to you on this supplemental report. Uh, there were a few corrections, as you noted. <laughs> and. Uh, we're gearing up for the 2023 report, so we've incorporated some of your suggestions, some of the breakdowns that we'll be including in future reports. So, but I'm here today to answer any questions you might have on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Soto Martinez. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Could you just explain the, uh, the, the corrections that were made and, and sure. what errors sure. we found? Absolutely. So as you can see in the items number 47 and 49, we're on the first addenda page. <clears throat> They were purchased numerous years ago, and Metropolitan Division advised us they have de been decommissioned and as such are not being used uh, and as such should not have been included on the report. As you can see, there were also some differences in the amounts of the items that were presented. We did a total amount, and as you can see, the breakdown don't necessarily jibe. What we found in that was that training costs were included on that. Um, they were included as a recurring training cost rather than a one-time training cost. And mm -hmm. when we went over our records, it was a one-time training cost. So we deducted that, and that reflects the new amounts that are included on Addendum 1. Uh, in addition, it, it's not necessarily an error, but we have, we, there was discussion when we originally started this report on whether acquisition costs needed to be included every year annually. Uh, the decision has now been made. We are going to include the acquisition cost if it's been acquired that year. So in the 2023 report, it will be the acquisition of costs will be included for items acquired in 2023. That wasn't the case in this last report, so you're going to note that some of them have been acquired years past and probably shouldn't have even been on your supplemental uh, information request. Got it. Well, that makes sense to me. I mean, it's, you know, we're taking That'll the... make it a little more easy. Yeah, I think it, so. it, It's the third iteration of this report, and I think... I think you guys will be happy with this year. <laughs> Hopefully I will be as well. So I think we're going to clear up some of this stuff. We're going to be more structured in our request to the various entities that are responsible for these items and, and get uh, a more uh, clear breakdown on the, the cost. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and I know it's the, the third report, and you know I'm, I'm new here, and I saw that, and I was like, this is interesting. You know, it's a, it's a new law. How do we apply it in the city? I thought it was yeah. helpful to dig in a little bit more. Um, is, is this something that, uh, the, the cost associated to this equipment, is that something that is um, presented in the budget request for LAPD, like, to maintain these Well, to maintain do these you mean the cost, like the general cost of everything, training, et cetera? Just the no, I mean, maintenance, generally, the whatever. Like, how much does this equipment cumulatively cost us year over year? Well, the equipment that you requested specifically on the follow-up, which was vehicle, Vehicles uh, with a initial initially listed on the report for 200,000 and above. We did do a five-year. We had motor transport do a five-year projected cost on the general fund. Okay. Generally, when items, you know, some of the items don't have a projected cost because once they're expired, such as the robotics, there's no updates for them. Right. Once they've expired, either a new piece of equipment will need to be purchased. Uh, but vehicles, maintenance, sure. et cetera, et cetera, there is an ongoing cost. And, and as far as it's been budgeted, each that's what makes the report so complicated, too. Sure, sure. Because these items, obviously, the legislator determined which items were military equipment. The various entities in the department that are responsible for these items, generally speaking, there's basically about five entities. But there will be crossover. The vehicles, as listed on this addenda, are, listed, are, are used by Metropolitan Division. Got it. But they're main, maintained by our motor transport. 
So our motor transport will have the maintenance costs and the acquisition cost will be with Metropolitan Division. Great. So it sounds like we'll now have a more accurate uh, number about this moving forward. I think that's that's That we will not? That we will, sorry. Yes, and I, you know, I want to say, of course, these are especially because of the cost, the law requires cost include personnel cost, uh, training cost, and that's salary based, right? right. And that it's really difficult to determine. So there will, I will always give you the caveat that they are of good faith, best faith estimates. Acquisition costs, really easy. The contract says how much this item cost us. That will be really easy. It's the other costs and the estimates on maintenance and stuff that I'll, I'll probably give you that caveat later we'll, in the year. We'll make some adjustments on the okay. following reports. Yeah. But, I, but I anticipate they'll, they'll be broken down more into segments so that you can kind of see as you requested on this follow-up. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. no, no more questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you thank so you much. Ma Appreciate you. you. You too. Have a great day. Thank you. And um, so, uh, Mr. Lid, uh, like to move to note and file this report as it was informational. Very good. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Very good. This matter note. Terrific. Colleagues, thank you all so much. I know we had a, it was quite a heavy agenda today, but I, it was great. Yeah, it was great. So thank you very much. Um, for the month of March, it's looking like we might be dark because of the recess uh, schedule that we have. And so, but uh, if anything changes, we will let you know because this is obviously one of the most pressing committee uh, committees that we have on the council. So should something uh, be required for us to, uh, to attend to, uh, we will convene so but otherwise we will keep you posted thank you so much mr lid i know our desk is clear desk is clear we are adjourned thank Excellent. you thank you